MovieWeb.com. I'm gonna assume you know who we are. Everybody in the German army's heard of you. You probably heard we ain't in the prisoner taking business. We in the killing Nazi business. And cousin, business is a uh, booming. <laughs> if you ever wanna eat a sauerkraut sandwich again, take your wiener schnitzel leg and finger and point out on this map what I wanna know. I respectfully refuse. Hey Donnie! Guys German here wants to die for country. Oblige him. Okay, now, first of all, can you tell me about this character you're playing in Inglorious Bastard? My character in Inglorious Bastard is named Donny Donowitz, and the Germans have a specific nickname for him, which is the Bear Jew. And he's a Jewish guy from Boston who has gone over to Germany with a baseball bat that he got every Jew in his neighborhood to sign with the name of someone they're worried about. And his whole thing is he wants to beat every Nazi to death he finds with it. So the bastards use him, they kind of keep him in reserve when they're interrogating people and getting information out of them. It's like the last order. It's like, all right, well, we're going to bring in the bear Jew. And he comes out and he just pummels them. And he does it because he, he feels like he's fighting on behalf of all the Jews who couldn't be there to fight. But he also wants to scare the hell out of the guy they're trying to get the information. Now, was this a complete creation by Quentin Tarantino? Or did you have help in like forming and crafting this guy? Well, it's interesting because I'm from Boston. And when Quentin told me about it, I said, you realize that everyone in Massachusetts actually had a baseball bat with it in their car. I mean, most bats in Massachusetts are used off the field. I mean, it's like, it's really a Boston thing. He said, no, I just had this character in mind. So he had it fully formed, but what I brought to it was I brought a lot of different stories, a lot of the language. There's some certain dialogue things that, you know, Quentin is very specific with the dialogue, but there were certain dialogue things that said, you know, Boston guys, when we beat the shit out of someone or someone's beating the crap out of us, we would say this, 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 or usually after a fight, someone does this. So there's kind of a whole rant that I do after I beat this one guy to death, and that was just quite letting me go. So, you know, we, we talked a great deal about the character, but it was it was really fully formed, and I was just adding, basically the the whole dish was there, I was just adding a little spice to it. So is he, like, capable of letting you come in and sort of throw in lines, or is he kind of opposed to that until he sees you work it through? Yeah, I mean, quite, the thing is, Quentin is a very, Quentin is the kind of director that wants you to be letter perfect. I mean, he doesn't want an A, an AN, the word fuck. He wants it exactly like it's written. You know, the, the dialogue, the rhythm of Tarantino's dialogue is very specific. It's like reading a poem. You can't just add a word here and there. But once he trusts you, and he trusts me as a writer, so he knew that I wasn't just going to try and change his dialogue for the purpose of changing it. You know, during the rehearsals, there is that period where you're saying lines and if something doesn't feel right, you can discuss it with them and work it so that it, that it feels right. Or if you have a suggestion, you can throw out an idea. I mean, that's, that's really what the rehearsal period is. And that was two weeks after. So, kind of once you're shooting, sometimes you'll come up with spontaneous stuff, but when you do the scene, he wants to hear it exactly the way it's written. And then usually what I'll do is I go, hey, Quentin, can you, can you give me one? I just want to try something. And that's once, once Quentin has what is exactly in his head and exactly on the page, that's when I'll add a little something to it. Now, what did you guys think of the response from Cannes, and how has the film changed since it aired over there? Yeah, I mean, Cannes was an amazing experience. I'd been there before with Death Proof, and when I worked for David Lynch, actually, I went over to, with Mahal and Drive premiere. Um, but I had never quite experienced the thunderous standing ovation like we saw at Cannes. They timed it and it was the longest ovation in history. It was like 10 or 11 minutes or something. So it, it was incredible to be in that room and see people standing and cheering and hearing the response. Um, but what was more incredible was walking around the street and people are going, hey, it's the bear Jew. You know, just <laughs> seeing people coming up to me having such an emotional response to the movie, saying that there were things that really, really stirred in them. And this is uh, Jews and non-Jews and Americans and French people and Germans. So that was overwhelming. But, I, you know, Quentin said that he was always planning to do some kind of pruning and trimming and changing things. But I think one of the reactions was there was a lot of stuff that he cut that we actually, I think he actually felt he overcut. You know, there were certain scenes that were taken out that he just didn't really have time to finish for Ken, that in the final version, it's like, yeah, the movie actually plays better with that. So I think the movie, if anything, is probably about three or five minutes longer. I haven't seen the final version, but from what Quentin has told me, he's actually fleshed it out a little bit more. I think Ken was 225, and I think this is 230 or something like that. Well, 
I don't know if you pay attention to reviews, but I've seen a lot of the like blogger reviews of the film, and they their one complaint is it's too talky. And I'm wondering, can you talk to that? I mean, sure. is it a legitimate you know, complaint? No, it's not. I mean, it's interesting. You know, people's complaints about movies are often very directly related to what their expectations of the movie are. And Quentin said that most of his films get mixed reviews. He said that Pulp Fiction, people had to see it three times because the first time they were this movie is so violent. And then they saw it again, they're like, oh, it's not as violent as we remember. And then the third time they saw it, and they were like, oh yeah, it's actually pretty funny. So it's actually a really funny movie. So even in Kill Bill, he said the first movie was all action, and people said, where's that great Tarantino dialogue? Kill Bill 2 was all dialogue. People said, what happened to the action of Kill Bill 1? So I think that there's always an adjustment period with Quentin's films. I don't think the film is too talky. I think the film is spectacular. I mean, it's. It's a movie that's two and a half hours and there's a lot of dialogue, but it's incredible tension and drama and it's exciting. And, I, you know, too talky to me, you can watch a lot, like there's some romantic comedies that are too talky. If a movie, I, I don't judge a movie by whether it's too talky or not talky enough. I think those kinds of complaints, I think, are frankly nonsense. I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of those reviewers are re reviewing stuff with an agenda. They feel that. Quentin is deified in a way that they don't like, or maybe that they wish they were deified, and they love to try and shoot them down, or they want to be contrary. I mean, you know, the, you look at some of these, you know, talkbacks on certain things, and people say, oh, Tarantino's a hack, this movie suck. I mean, one of the great things about Tarantino movies is that they inspire discussion <laughs> and inspire fights. And if you've noticed, a lo one of the fans love to fight about movies on the internet. It was always, remember, Cabin Fever versus Saw, or Cabin Fever versus May, and then Saw versus Hostel. They love to verse movies and argue. And so people are so excited about the film, there's such high expectations, there's always people that are going to shoot it down. And there's legitimate critics that sometimes you read them like, oh yeah, okay, that's, I can see their point, I can see where they're coming from, but you know, a movie shouldn't please everybody. It's not made for everybody. Well, right now it seems like also the critics that have seen it, yeah. are like bragging about the fact that they have seen it and almost want to put it down for other people that haven't gotten course, a chance to see it. Yeah, it's like, it's like when Phantom Menace came out, the people that were the first ones to see it were so happy to tell how much they hated it. They want to brag that they're the first ones to see it. And there are always those movies. Matrix 2. People were like, no, it's terrible, it sucks. They want to be the one spoiling it. And I'm, I think it's human nature. I mean, I'd love to say... Part of me feels that there's this whole culture of negativity on those internet sites mm -hmm. anyway. And I think the internet is great, and I think it's really brought fans together. But what it's also done is it's given a place for people to complain. I mean, that is where you go. When you like a movie, you tell your friends. When you hate a movie, you tell the internet. <laughs> so I think that a lot, the majority of these things that are written on the internet are negative. And it's obviously, it's obviously great when there's a nice review and people read it and you go, oh wow, the first person really got the movie and really appreciated it. But it's one of those things where I think it's going to take people, everybody's read the script, so it's going to take people an adjustment period to see the movie, get whatever their expectations were, if they expected it to be an action war movie. I would say this, actually I know I'm going all over the place. I think people, I think what people's, people's opinions of movies are very directly related to how they were sold the film. And if they're sold, this is two and a half hours of action, then the film feels too talky. If you're told this is Reservoir Dogs, there's standoff and tension and dialogue, and it has that great Pulp Fiction dialogue with action scenes here and there, then they love it. I remember with Cabin Fever, when people were told, this is the scariest movie you're ever going to see, they hated it. When they were told someone made this low-budget splatter movie, it's disgusting, it's scary, it's fun, it's absurd, it's weird, they loved it. And it was the same movie. It's just how they were told what the movie was. Well, how were they marketed the film? So I think that often has a lot to do with it too. I was gonna say that could almost help this then, because there hasn't been too much of a marketing push yet for the film, except for a lot of the critic the reviews. Yeah. You read it's too talky, and then you go and see it, and it's not as talky as you're expecting. And then right. all of a sudden you're like, I think What are you talking about? Too talky. It's, it's, very, like, it's very hard for people to now with the flood of information you can get. It's hard to just go see a movie and judge it based on what the movie is. And all you can ask people to do is to go see the film and watch it and take it for what it is and enjoy it. And not think about this review or that review. People bring so much baggage to a movie with them now. It's, it's hard to get by that, but that's just the way it is. Now, I'm most interested with you about how you took 
your acting and sort of are easing it more into the films of other directors? Because I just heard you were in Piranha, and I'm wondering, yeah. why did you decide to also be an actor as I opposed not, to a director? I never decided to be an actor. I always That's liked like doing kind of, it started as me wanting to do a Hitchcock kind of cameo in my film. You know, I just walk on for a second and the people that know me would go, oh, there was Eli, he was, you know, in the bus mm -hmm. stop, the bus pulled away. But then I had to fire an actor on Cabin Fever and there were no other actors around. I've been reading it in rehearsal and I put on the makeup and I became Justin. Well, Quentin loved that so much, he put me in Death Group. I didn't want to be in Death Group. I was like, no, I'm shooting Hostel 2, I'm a director. And he goes, no, you got to do it, you got to do it, you got to do it. And it was fun. And then I was shooting Thanksgiving. I was like, okay, I'll give myself a decapitation. I never really took it seriously. And then Quentin called me and he said, you're going to be Donowitz. I did not audition for the part. He was auditioning other actors against me. Now, Quentin knows me so well, and we spent so much time together, and he's heard me talk in my Massachusetts accent, my mass whole voice, plenty of times. He knew I could do it. And he said, no, you're not taking this seriously. You, you, he knew that I had the potential. He's like, you don't even, he goes, I can tell you're like me. You want to do this. You just, you just need someone to push you. You're never going to put yourself in your own films in a big role, but now you have permission to. And I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, if I'm really going to do this for Quentin, I have to, I have to be great at it. I can't just phone it in. I can't just do a good job. I can't be the guy that didn't fuck up the movie. I have to push myself to tap into a level of talent that I had buried since I was five years old, which is when I was like, oh, I want to be an actor at five. And then by six or seven, I was like, no, I want to be a director. That's where it's at. And that's where my true passion is at. But I always loved it and always wanted to do it. I just never pushed myself to do it. I never took that talent seriously. And Quentin really made me devote myself to it and dedicate it. And I, and I dropped everything and I committed my life to this part. Because I said I, I wanted people to come out of the movie going, wow, we had no idea he was capable of that. And then Alex Aja called and I said, that's it. I'm never, I was like, it's never going to get better than this. I'm retiring. I said, it's, it's Quentin and Brad. How can I have a better experience than this? Than being in a lead role in a Quentin Tarantino movie with Brad Pitt, Diane Kruger, Christoph Waltz, Michael Fassbender, all these great actors and have the time of my life. But then Alex Aja calls and said, we want you to host the wet t-shirt contest in Piranha 3D. And I said, what time do you need me there? And that was it. And literally, there was a, a scene that Alex wrote for me, and Alex is a friend. And I thought, okay, I'll do this. And that was, it was purely for fun. So the kind of acting that I want to do is I want to act in roles that I now write for myself, or if it's a director I really like, or a friend that wrote a part for me. And that's it. I'm not an actor available for hire. It's only for directors like Quentin or someone I really, really respect or someone who's a friend.